Hey there, church family. Uh, good morning and welcome to our fifth consecutive week of online church. And um, again, it's kind of neat to say that word church because although it's, it's unfortunate we can't be in our building right now, we can still gather together as believers and as a church family. And we can also welcome any guests who have joined us. Um, and again, anyone who is joining us today, if you don't have a home church, we would love to have you join us and be part of uh, what we're building together and doing in Elba at First Baptist Church. So with that said, uh, we are about to begin our sixth week in this state and in our nation of staying home and staying safe. How has that affected our lives? Um, it's affected us in many ways, profound ways. It's affected uh, schooling, it's affected jobs, it's affected the economy, it's affected stock market. So many ways that we can focus on and be worried about. But at the same time, I want to encourage you to say, okay, my sense of normal has been turned completely upside down. And what is this new normal? What is God doing with this time to shape me and mold me so that I am prepared when the world does get back to some sense of a new normal? How will I be used in that to impact it and make a difference and help people around me in new and different ways? Um, and I say that to encourage you. Um, I want to focus on the positives today. I want to say thank you to anyone watching who's a healthcare worker or an essential uh, provider in that arena. Um, your work is so valued and you are on the front lines and we are praying for you and just want you to be safe and healthy. Um, just thank anyone there again who still has the ability to work uh, and whose job has not been impacted. Uh, just to keep on what you're doing, stay safe, stay healthy and help the public as you can. Um, for those who have been affected and who can't work, we are praying for you. Uh, I know that's not easy. It brings a host of challenges. If you have children, they're home from school. Um, if you've lost your job or temporarily been affected, there are huge burdens that come with that. And we understand and we're, we're here for you to support you and pray for you. Um, so please let us know. Please reach out to either Pastor Michael Davis. Um, you can reach out to me or any of the other deacons at church. Um, and we can put you in touch with um, with people who will just, they can talk to you and pray for you uh, because we do care so much about you. So again, be thinking this week, how's God shaping me and molding me to meet the needs of people now, but also as we move forward after this. Um, and again, it's all in God's hands, but he loves you and he cares about you. And I'm just encouraged that we can be together again today here in our fifth service. And we're looking uh, to God, what he has to teach us today and know that he's gonna bring us through this stronger and better for it. We may have to suffer now, but there's a reason why it's happening in the here and now. And I think God's gonna teach us great things. So be encouraged, um, stay in his word, stay connected to people. Don't, don't lose contact with people, it's so important. But just stay safe, stay healthy, uh, and take care of yourselves. And we'll, we'll talk again soon, but enjoy the worship service today. Hi, Church family. This is the Shaga family. We are doing okay. Hope all of you are too. We, we love, love and, and miss you all. all. Bye. Hello, Church family. Me and my dad just want to share a song for you today by Tim Timmons. It's called Rest My Soul. soul arise God's in control you're not alone rise into his light his plans are good you're on his side God of perfect peace you are here with me on this ring Sing my 
My name is Michael Davis. I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Church, Elba, in New York. And I wanted to welcome you here today. Uh, maybe you're a visitor with us here for the first time, and I'd love to invite you to connect with us uh, through email. At, and here's going to be the email, uh, office at fbcelba.net. Um, and since we can't meet in person, I'd be glad to connect with you in that way while we're in this time. Uh, maybe you're a church member, a friend, a family member who's gotten connected uh, with our church during this time. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. I want you to um, just enjoy walking through this service time with us. And so with that, the title for today is going to be Restart. We're going to be in Nehemiah 4, 15 through 23, um, picking up where we left off a few weeks ago. We took a break for Easter, and now we're jumping back into our study in Nehemiah. And so the phrase that I want you to remember today is just a restart accomplished with purpose. Anytime there's a restart, anytime you redo something, anytime you reevaluate or rethink something, you want to do that accomplished with a purpose. You want to do that with a focus on how you're going to do that and be effective at doing it. Now, maybe you think of restart in the way that uh, our church will have to look at. How, when we restart services on campus again, how is that going to look like? Are we going to do things differently? Are we going to think about maybe the way that we used to do things and, and maybe some things that we've changed recently? Um, if anything else, I want you to think about the restart maybe in your own life where God has opened up your eyes in the midst of this pandemic to things that you need to change. Maybe you have already done that in your devotional life. I want to encourage you that as you walk through those things with the Lord in the scriptures, um, that you would be encouraged that, that while there's difficulty going on right now in the world, God is using that difficulty to shape and to mold and to change you into his image. And he's bringing you closer to him, hopefully, through this time. Um, now that takes an active uh, part on our side of things to, to just be able to say, God, we love you and we trust you, and in whatever direction you point us, we know it's for our good and for your glory. And so um, with that in mind, um, I want to just point us into the text that we're going into today and remind you about the series that we're going through. Um, the series is 2020 for the next 200. Now, <clears throat> when you think about that, um, you may think, well, what does that mean? Well, we're in the year 2020. And for the next 200, it just means that um, we're looking forward to what God's going to do in the next 200 years. Well, why do I say 200 years? Because uh, this summer, actually, on June 20th, our church will turn 200 years old. And so we're celebrating that this year, but also saying, God, there were a group of people that started this church in 1820. And God, there'll be a group of people, we pray and we hope, that in 100 and 200 years from now, if this church is still here doing ministry, which we pray and we hope for that, we'll be looking back and going, I wonder what those people were doing. Well, our hope and our uh, place that we need to be in is having this perspective that we want the church to be here in the future. And that means us taking some steps, especially during this time, to restart, to reevaluate, to look at the things that we've done on a regular basis and say, God, just like the people in Nehemiah's time as they, um, in Ezra's time as they rebuilt the temple, as they rebuilt the wall, God, what are we going to do? Um, God, how, what things honor you? What things don't? And those are the things that really matter. Everything else doesn't. And so as we walk into this time, I want to remind us of just a phrase we've been using. We want to be about putting on gospel lenses to see God's vision for our church for the future. Now many of you think, what does a restart look like? Well, uh, if you grew up um, when I did uh, in the early to mid-90s and you were, you know, uh, maybe you were interested in computers, things like that. If I said a phrase, you would probably know what I meant, and it's this, Control-Alt-Delete. Now, when I say that, many of you should know what that means, especially if you use PC computers. And um, what that means is that when there were other problems going on with your computer, there was always a fail-safe, always a way to restart, always a way to kind of take programs offline that maybe weren't working right, and it was Control-Alt-Delete. And when you did that, a special menu popped up, and you were able to say, I want to turn this program off, I want to reset the computer, so maybe it'll, when it restarts, I'll have a fresh start. Some of us wish that maybe there's a restart for our situation right now. We wish that maybe there was a, man, if God, if there was just a Control-Alt-Delete series of buttons that I could push to make everything right, to bring everything back to the way that it was, then I would want to do that. But I want to challenge you that, that maybe we're not looking at things the right way. If that's all that we desire, just to be able to push a series of buttons or be able to do something that could bring things back to the way that you were doing things before, because if I had to guess, God has revealed some things to you in this time that, that I don't think you want to let go. I don't think you would want to change. And so um, as we walk through this time together, I want us to take a serious look at the things that God wants us to, to keep. God wants us to continue to do and the things that we've changed. And then when we go back to service time, 
what is that going to look like as well? Now, we're in about a month of the time that we've spent uh, maybe being in our homes. Maybe you're in essential services, and so I want to just um, thank you for those things that you're doing. We have members that are serving in home health care and physical therapy and, and directly um, nursing and being involved with patients who are in the hospital. And so I want to um, just ask us to give a special prayer for those of our church members who are directly involved uh, doing that special ministry and pray for opportunities to share the gospel. Now we're looking at a, really a time of rebuild, of restart. And people talk about when is the economy going to re be able to restart? When is the uh, when is regular work going to be able to restart? When can school restart? In the same way, we look at things like church. When are we going to be able to restart doing church like we did it before? Well, when we return, things probably won't be exactly the same as they were before. Some things good. Things, some things we think, oh, maybe not. Uh, th some things we think, oh, I don't want to have to do that. Um, when we go out now, um, if you do have to go out, um, they're telling you have to wear a mask. And so um, as we do those things, I want to just remind us that while there's a lot of other things that change around us, in a true restart and looking at the things that God wants us to do, we need to be focused on those. Now do everything else that you're supposed to do, but let's take a special look at what God wants us to do in our restart. When we restart things for our church and church services, and even now in the things that you're restarting, and I want to challenge you in your own personal walk, that as we look at these things, we have to be about what God wants. We have to be about God's purposes, His goals, the things that He wants to see us do. And specifically for our church, our vision statement is this, that we want to be about loving Christ, growing the church, and reaching the community. And so what that looks like when we come back, I don't know, but I know that centered around this vision statement of what God wants, He will bring us together and accomplish His purpose. So while some of us would say, God, I, I wish we could just restart. I wish we could just maybe hit, even hit that reset button, button of fixing everything. But we know that things won't just be fixed. And so what we have to do is say, instead of the reset, we want to say, God, how do we restart in the right way? How do we restart in a way that would honor you? How do we do church in a way that would honor you? How do we in our own lives, as you're working on our hearts and our minds, as we kind of readjust, be reoriented around you, as everything else in the world gets stripped away, we say, God, what do you want? How do you want us to live? And so before we jump into the text, um, we want to know the background of Ezra and Nehemiah. So if you're joining us for the first time, I want to just give you a reminder of that. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah were written by Ezra. And initially they were called Ezra 1 and 2. And over time, as the Bible would put, was put together, they changed that to Ezra and Nehemiah because of the characters that were involved in the text. Now, the story is that the people of God have come back from captivity. They had acted wicked, wickedly in the past, and, and God allowed them to come back to Jerusalem to rebuild. They started with the temple. It took them 20 years to rebuild the temple. Then in this extended period of time takes place between the finishing of the temple and then Nehemiah coming with another group of people and starting the rebuild of the walls. Now the themes of Ezra and Nehemiah is this idea of restoration and revitalization. Now how interesting it is that our church is in that season right now, restoration of revitalization. God is doing a great work in the hearts of our people, of our church members and those in our community um, to see our church do things that maybe they've done in the past and, and to reach out and to grab people that are in our community and say, Here's an opportunity to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you knew him before. Maybe you stopped going to church. Maybe now's the time to get back involved. And I'd like to challenge you that as we walk through this together, as we look at the theme of Nehemiah, now's the time to take a hard look in the mirror. And maybe if you were like the people in Nehemiah's time that were returning to Jerusalem, they were taking a hard look in the mirror and saying, God, what are the things that honor you? What are the things that don't? God, especially coming to church services, being involved with the community of faith. I want to challenge you that as we are allowed to go back to a normal way of doing things, maybe you just need to say, God, I know I haven't been to church in a while. God, I know I haven't been involved with the community of faith. Uh, maybe you're watching this and you live in the area and God's just telling you, you've got to get back involved. You've got to be a part of the community of faith. So I'd like to challenge you as we get into the text, uh, maybe God's wanting you to restart something in your life. Maybe that's just a special time with Him that you haven't done before, a devotional time. Uh, maybe that's going to church for the first time. Uh, maybe that's going back to church after it's been 5, 10, 15 years. Whatever it is, I pray that during this time, God will allow you to focus in on that and that when things do return back to normal, uh, that you'd be able to do that. And so here we go. We're going to jump into the beginning in verse 15. Here's the first idea. We want to restart the work. We just want to restart work. In verse 15, it says this, When our enemies heard that it was 
known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. So what happened was God listened to the prayers of the people, to Nehemiah, and he frustrated the work that the enemy of God was trying to do. All the people that were surrounding the people of God and Satan himself were trying to thwart, which was the rebuild of the wall and the separation of the people from the rest of the lands to be made holy. Maybe for you and your family, you've just restarted a time of personal devotion. Maybe this has been a special time for you, and I'm so glad about that, that you've been able to, uh, to be brought close to the Lord and each other through maybe special family Bible study time, if not just the main service time where you sit around your TV, your computer, your phone, and you listen to the message, to a message like this. And I'm encouraged by that. I want you to know that our family in the same way has had a special time of just uh, renewed uh, Bible study and prayer together as we seek God during this time. As other things are uncertain, uh, as things change, uh, we always tend to be brought closer to God when the rest of the world seems uncertain. But yet, we should be like that all the time. Now, the original wall of Jerusalem was built around 1000 BC by Solomon as he built the temple, the original temple of God. It was said that he consulted the ancient Phoenicians in building the wall around Jerusalem. And the specifications around the wall, about two and a half miles long, were was mainly 20 feet high and 20 feet wide. Now this was done for a variety of reasons, but it kept uh, people from the outside out. It made attack very difficult as people would have to go through a very thick structure to get through and they would have to go over a very tall wall. Now, interestingly enough, 300 years later, in 700 BC, when the Great Wall of China was constructed. It was said the ancient Phoenicians were also consulted in the building of this wall. And the structure itself, which was originally designed for Jerusalem and the walls surrounding Jerusalem, was 20 feet high and 20 feet wide. Now, today, we know that the Great Wall of China still exists, and it's one of those things that you can see from space, or so I'm told. The wall surrounding Jerusalem, the original wall, can actually be still seen to this day as well in certain areas. Now in 445 BC, Nehemiah comes back and they begin the rebuild work surrounding Jerusalem. Now this was not going to be like the original walls. It would not have been returned to its original glory. But yet it would be a wall that separated the people from the outside land. And it would have been created for a purpose to separate people inside of the wall from those of the outside. So they'd be reminded of who they were that they wouldn't be drawn away by idol philosophies and idol worship. Now for our church, again, surrounded around our vision of loving Christ, growing our church and reaching the community, well, we want to take a hard look in the mirror right now, not only personally, individually, but when we come back, a church that turns 200 years old, what does that look like? What are the things that we continue to do? What are the things that we stop doing? And I think that God wants us each to take a that hard look in the mirror and say, God, how do we restart? How do we restart our prayer life? How do we restart our devotional life? How do we restart our family life? Men, as you lead your family, how do you restart that family devotional life? Now, many times we're discouraged because we just don't know what it's supposed to look like. But the truth is that God wants us to lead our families. He wants us to grow closer together, not just during this time, but all the time. So as we start to restart, as we go back to work, as we go back to school, whenever that might be, we can't lose the special focus that we've been given on God. We have to continue to do that. And in verse 16, it says this, From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, half held the spears, shields, bows, coats of mail, and the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah. So they returned to a, the work with a seriousness, with a goal in mind, completing the work. And the people of God actually did this in 52 days. So while the temple of God took 20 years to build, the wall only took 52 days. Now, churches, we begin to take a look at rebuild about not only our own lives, but the church. What do things look like as we move into the future? God wants us to remember that he's always with us. He's always on our side. He's working with us to accomplish these goals. And we can't forget that there's an enemy, just like Nehemiah. And in his time, there were people that were working against this. They were direct uh, instruments of Satan. We looked at the people like this, with Sanballat and Tobiah, those who are directly working to thwart the work of God on the walls. And then in verse 17, it says, who were building on the wall, those who carried the burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon in the other. So their focus was divided. They were not only building the wall, but they were defending at the same time. And in a lot of the same ways, as we're centered, as we're focused on God, we realize 
that we are defending. Our job is to defend against an enemy who's trying to attack us, who's trying to attack the church. He's trying to discourage us. He's trying to get us um, in this time to despair, to lose hope. But the truth is this is the greatest time to cling to God and say to the enemy, to Satan, you have no part here. You have no claim here. I am a child of God, and I will not be thwarted. I will not be pulled away from God. I will not lose focus. I will stay focused, centered on who God is. And that is what God wants for us. And while we kind of have that divided focus, we stay focused, centered on God. We defend regularly against the enemy. And I'll give you some tools to be able to do that. A few weeks ago, we looked at Ephesians 6 and the introduction to the armor of God. And today we're going to look at the armor of God. So Ephesians 6, 14 through 18, it says this. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayers and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now I know when we go back to the way that things have been, things that were, we will have the temptation to return exactly back to the thing, the way that things were. And I want to challenge you that as you maybe move back into a season of normalcy, whenever that is, I want to remind us about what God is doing and His armor that He's given us. Now, I pray this on every single day because I know that there's an enemy and he's serious. He is trying to destroy me. He's trying to destroy my family. He's trying to destroy the church and the work that we're doing. And I want to challenge you that God has given us the tools. He's given us the scripture but he's given us specific things that we can use against the enemy. For instance, truth, the belt of truth. How do we use that? Well, as people of God, we are truthful. And in this time, we have to not compromise our standards, maybe get things that we want or accomplish things that we want. We have to be about the truth. And we're set apart from the rest of the world in that way. We have the breastplate of righteousness, and that covers all the internal organs, the important things that God has given us, our hearts, which should be centered on God. And when we don't prepare for battle, when we don't prepare to defend ourselves against the enemy, he takes advantage of that. He says, I'm going to get into your mind. I'm going to get into your heart. I'm going to whisper things in your ear that when we're not prepared, we hear that whisper of things are never going to turn around. Things are hopeless. When you go back to church, are you going to be able to do the things you used to do, to worship, to focus on God? Maybe not. And so Satan wants us to doubt those things, but we've been given the tools to defend against him. What about the gospel of peace? It comes with the shoes that God gives us spiritually. We have to be reminded constantly of the hope that we have in the gospel and that we can give that to other people. We walk in a peace that other people don't have. You want to know what I've noticed about our membership and what, I've prou what I'm proud of? Is that when I talk to you on the phone, when I send emails back and forth, when I get the texts, when I share things on Facebook, whatever it might be, this is the theme that I keep hearing that we are people that are confident in the Lord, that we have a peace that comes with an understanding of the gospel, what Jesus has done for us, and no matter what the world does to us, no matter what Satan can do to us, no matter what people around us or, or any illness can, can take place, we have the hope of the gospel, which is an eternal security in Jesus Christ our Lord, which grants us that life in heaven forever with God. What about the shield of faith? Satan is constantly throwing things at us, and we need to be aware of what God has given us, the tools to defend against the enemy. And as we pray on that shield of faith, God, we say, we have faith in what you have done for us. In fact, you give us that faith. You give us, the scripture tells us, that faith to believe. And the shield that comes with that, we're able to defend against the enemy. So as he tries to whisper things, as he throws evil thoughts at us, we say, here's our shield of faith. We cannot be shaken. What about the helmet of salvation? We have, again, the assurance, salvation, the hope that we have that no matter what happens, we will be with God in heaven forever when we die. And we put that on as a helmet to protect our minds from the enemy of salvation, the hope that we have. And we remind ourselves of that. And every day I do that. I hope that you will too. What about the sword? One of the most powerful weapons that we have against the enemy is the word of God. It says the sword of the spirit, which we take up and we actively fight against the enemy. And as we read passages like this, Satan hates it. And he says, I wish they wouldn't do that, but we're going to keep doing that, all right? And we're praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So what do we need to do? We need to keep alert and we need to persevere during this time. Not 
like we're crawling under a rock and waiting for things to pass, but that we are actively seeking God during this time and opportunities to share our faith, to reach out, to do something kind, to meet a need. And we pray for those in need. We pray for our, our members who are serving faithfully out there. Uh, we pray for our church and that our um, exceeding hope to gather together is grown um, immensely until we are able to come together and we get to celebrate that. Now here's the second thing. We restart together. We can't do this on our own. We live in a culture that is primarily a do-it-yourself culture. If you can you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and do it on your own, that's what you should do. Well, the scripture is very contradictory to that. Here's what verse 18 says. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Now, this was Nehemiah, one of Nehemiah's right-hand men. And as they worked on the wall together, he had a guy who was right by him. That at any moment, if there was an enemy who was approaching, he would look to that guy and he'd say, Do your thing. Sound the trumpet. And we're going to see why. Because the people were rallied together through God's purposes, but also ready to defend physically and spiritually to what was going on. And Nehemiah set up these things in place so the people would have confidence, not only for the day of battle if it took place physically, but also for the spiritual and the anxiety and the emotional things that were going on in their minds. He said, I've got a plan and God is behind us. During this time, we have to band together in the same way. We need to be praying for each other. And, and while some of us may think, I can do this on my own, you can't. And God never meant it to be that way. He gave us uh, a community of faith to be able to do these things together, to pray for one another. And I always hear it say, when I ask people, how are you doing? How can we pray for you? Um, what needs do you have? Oh, everything's great. I'm doing wonderful. No problems. Even in a time like this. And if we were to be honest, there are probably some things that are going on in our hearts and minds, some doubt, some worry. And so I want to encourage you that it's okay not to be okay. But we need to share that with the community of faith. We need to pray for one another and encourage one another during this time, whether it be over text, social media, a phone call, a video chat. God's given us those tools also to be able to connect. Verse 19 says this, And I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, The work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. Nehemiah acknowledges the truth. He knows that uh, over a two and a half mile span, the people of God, while they're not many, are spread out and they're working on various places on the wall. But he's got a plan to rally the people together again. He's got the guy who's ready to blow the trumpet, who's ready to reach out and say, we need help here. We need you to come here. And Nehemiah wants the people to know that they're not alone. And I want you to know that today, you are not alone either. We live in this community of faith together while we're in our homes, while we're out, maybe a few of you just doing your work and things in essential services, I want to remind us we are not alone. We have God on our side, and we have our community of faith, our church family at First Baptist Church here in Elbin, New York. And we need to be reminded of that on a regular basis. While we are distant, while we're separated from one another physically, God is reminding us that we are being joined always spiritually as the family of faith through God and what He's doing through the Holy Spirit that he's placed in our lives. So when you're going through the difficulty, when you're going through the struggle, whatever it is, whenever it is, reach out to the family of faith and they will answer the call. In verse 20, it says, In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. Do you know that we serve a God who is fighting for us, who will fight for us when we need him? He's always fighting for us. Sometimes it just takes us reaching out our hands. Sometimes it just takes us, like in Ephesians 6, praying on that armor of God and saying, God, I'm ready to do battle. I'm here with you, and I need your help. All those tools that he gives us are given to us as a reliance on him in the spirit and the power of what he is doing. We see this all throughout Ezra and Nehemiah. The scripture tells us that they are given the power through God. Their hands are strengthened through what God is doing. And they relied on him. And I want to ask you that question. How do we do that? Church, it's not about our abilities, about our power. It's not about us just saying, we can do this on our own. It's about us being obedient and following God faithfully as a community of faith walking through this together and saying, God, we're going to honor you. We're going to serve you no matter what. Let me ask you this question. If your house was on fire, would you call the fire department? And what I mean by that is that if there was difficulty going on, if there was struggle, if there was anxiety, if there was worry and doubt and depression, then would you reach out? Would you say, God, I need your help? But more than that, would you also say, family of faith, I need your help for what's going on right now in my life. Now here's the third thing, and this is what we'll end on. Restart defense. 
And as a reminder, the title today is just Restart, and it's accomplished with purpose. Everything has purpose that is successful, that succeeds. You find that in business and leadership models. But the same thing applies to the church, and that God has given us in His Word specific goals, specific purpose to accomplish His will. And sometimes it takes a restart to really get things in perspective. I think that's what God is doing for us. He's, willing, he's allowing us to see. And in verse 21, in this third point, Restart Defense, it says this, so we labored at the wall, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. Verse 22, I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. Now here's the first question I want to ask you in this. How long do we defend? So how long do we say, God, we're going to be on guard against the enemy? God, during this special time of restart for us and our families and our church, how long do we want to be on guard? How long do we want to be on defense? The answer to that question is that we never stop being on defense towards the enemy. God gives us those tools to do that. And he says, I want you to pray on these things. I want you to take on the armor of God to fight against the devil on a regular basis. And I want to help you do that. He's right there alongside us. Let's remember that. Nehemiah knew there was an enemy and he was very close, not just Satan himself, but also the forces that were working against the people of God, the people who were around them. And they were building this wall to separate themselves. Now we live and we operate and we work in a, a world that is secular. Now God's not saying you need to separate yourself from all the people and not interact with them. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that in our daily lives, we set up boundaries and goals and spiritual discipline in order to be wholly devoted to God only. Now, we're able to do this in a special way in that we have the Holy Spirit and He dwells inside of us. But it takes action on our part daily seeking God to maintain our relationship and to also grow closer to Him. Some of you may think, I'm a good husband, I'm a good wife, I'm a good kid. But God doesn't desire for us to just be good, for us to be maybe kind or considerate according to the world's standards. He wants us to be great according to his standards. He wants us to be close to him and covered in his love and brought close to him in all these situations that are going on. In the same way for the people of God, they were being brought close to God during this time of special focus on him. And that's what God does in the difficult times. We can't lose sight of that. In verse 23, it says, So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. Now here's a second question I want to ask you. Do we ever let our guard down against the enemy? Well, the answer to that is definitely not. To Satan, to the forces that are at work against us. Maybe you have taken this as you know, some sort of extended snow day. And, and, I, and I can't help but, but make the observation that would be the most detrimental thing you could do to your spiritual walk. God is trying to renew us. He's trying to help us restart in an area that would bring us closer to Him. And we can't take this as just a, maybe I'll take a day off. Maybe you take a holiday every once in a while. Maybe you take, you know, well, Saturday's my day, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep in. I'm not going to do anything related to God. I'm not going to talk with Him. I need a break. The truth is that God wants us to be wholly devoted to Him every day. He wants us to, whether it's getting up in the morning early to spend time with Him. Maybe it's... Um, going to bed a little bit later so that you can spend time with him in the evenings. Maybe you got time in the middle of the day. Whenever it is, we need to be devoted to God. We need to be thinking about his purposes, his goals. We need to be reading his word daily. And God has given us that tool in the sword of the spirit. How do we use the sword of the spirit? Well, we won't be able to if we don't know it. So we need to be reading it. And in order to, to do this restart, we have to do it together. We have to defend together. We have to restart this defense and this idea that there is an enemy and he's working against us and we have to say I will not just lay down and I will not just be beat up by Satan I will take a stand against him with my family not just during this time but when we go back to church services together we're able to see each other in person we're able to stand rightly together and say Satan has no part in my home Satan has no part in my life he has no part with my family and he has no part in our church now, this is going to take us preparing. This is going to take us actively making a choice to, to practice these spiritual disciplines, to be focused on God. And um, some people attributed this statement to Benjamin Franklin. It goes like this. Remember, if you fail to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Now, this actually didn't come from Benjamin Franklin. It came from uh, the Reverend H.K. Williams in 1919. And... 
if you don't know what was going on around that time, uh, the Spanish flu had taken hold of the world in 1918, and it was still a very present problem in 1919, uh, much like what's going on right now. And the Reverend H.K. Williams uh, was writing to pastors who were needing to provide hope and encouragement to their congregants. And so instead of providing maybe some flowery statement, he just said, here's what you need to know. And he made this statement. Remember, if you fail to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Church family, God wants us to get serious about preparing for the work that he wants us to do in the future, but also preparing each day to grow spiritually, to make those steps, to prepare to spend time with God. And for you, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but maybe we just need to, again, take a hard look in the mirror and say, in this restart, this time of, for our church, revitalization, restoration, in this time as we are being restarted, as we're kind of on pause right now and then saying, what does it look like when we actually are able to, to restart life? God wants us to say, take special account of the things that I care about, the things that matter to me because they should matter to us. And remember, if you fail to prepare, you're preparing to fail. God doesn't want us to fail. He's given us the tools to, to succeed. So let's do that. Now remember the title for today's Restart. And it's the phrase that we want to remember is just accomplished with purpose. We can't just expect a restart being refocused on God and staying that way to happen on its own. It takes hard work. It takes diligence. It takes focus. It takes us preparing to do that. And we have to accomplish it with a purpose. And our purpose in mind is our vision statement. We want to be about loving Christ, growing the church, and reaching the community. And that filters into everything else that we do. And so I want to close with this. Um, maybe uh, you think during a time like this, or maybe other people have said to you, well, where is God in a time like this? Has he taken a day off? Why are things so difficult? Does God not care about us? And he does. And the truth is he loves us more than we could possibly imagine. We celebrated that last week at Easter when we were able to say God loves us so much that he sent his only son to live a sinless life for us, to die on the cross for our sins, and then to be raised from the dead on that third day so that we might have eternal life if we put our faith and trust in him. And although now it's natural to maybe doubt from time to time, but I want to show you this video and then we'll close out the service just reminding us on where God is always. Take a look. Where is God? We see him in the splendor of a sunset. We sense his glory on the mountaintop. We know he is enthroned in the heavenlies. But these are not his only dwelling places. He is also found in the fiery furnace, in the belly of a whale, in the lion's den, in the prison cell, on stormy seas. He is there in the dark watches of the night. He is at rock bottom. He is there at the end of the rope, even in the valley of the shadow of death. Where is God? He dwells in the place where you need him most. So I want to leave you with those words. The Lord, our God, goes with you. He will never forsake you. So in a time like this, as there are doubts all over the world, as people question, as you turn on the news, maybe instead of turning to those outlets, turn to God's word. Because in Deuteronomy 31, 6, it says, The Lord, our God, he goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Let us take encouragement in the words and the promises that God gives us during this time. Let us be focused on who he is. In this time of restart, let, let us say, God, we want to accomplish this with a purpose. We want to come back even stronger than ever in our own lives spiritually. God, as we are praying on the armor of God, maybe even daily, as I've encouraged you to do, we come back with a special focus, a special emphasis, and we're able to do the work that God wants us to do faithfully, together, for God's glory. I love you, church family. Have a great day.
Sing for joy.